Welcome everyone to our CLE today. My name is Joe Lawson. I'm the Deputy Director at the Harris County Law Library and I also direct the Legal Tech Institute which uh, brings you this program today. Before we get started I just want to say thank you to the Harris County Attorney's Office CLE Committee for uh, processing the CLE uh, forms for us that gives you an hour of CLE and an hour of ethics today. Uh, if you need that, just make sure that you sign up in the lobby if you haven't already. Um, additionally, we are in the County Attorney's Conference Center, so we want to uh, thank the office for the space. Uh, our speaker today uh, is somebody who focuses in the area of legal research, especially electronic legal research. This is Professor Amanda Watson from uh, the University of Houston Law Center. She's the new director at the O'Quinn Law Library there. Amanda comes to us from New Orleans, and that's a dangerous thing to say because no matter how I pronounce it, I'm going to take somebody off, right? <laughs> so I'll, put, I'll say it that way. Uh, but she was the associate director at Tulane there. Prior to that, she was the state law librarian for the state of Mississippi and also uh, served as a law librarian for Phelps Dunbar in the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, she comes to us from Mississippi. She received her JD from Ole Miss and then her Master of Information Science from Florida State University, and today she's going to talk to us a little bit about ethics and legal research. Without further ado, uh, Professor Amanda Watson. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here with you today, and that's not just me being nice, I am, because I usually teach law students. They're not nearly as attentive. They all would have their laptops open now, probably on J. Crew, looking for an outfit for the weekend, and instead you're actually taking notes and looking at me, so I appreciate that. Um, Joe's introduction was lovely and it, it recognized how old I am. I've been doing this a really long time um, and I really love legal research and I'm glad to share with you today. And one thing I'd love to ask you guys briefly is to tell me what you practice in and it doesn't have to be a big explanation, but I really wanna make sure that each of you actually get something to take back with you today. Um, and not just the CLE credit, which I know is lovely, but it's actually something that I can share with you. So we'll, we can just start up here, and if you can just tell me a little bit about your practice, I'd really appreciate it. IP, great. Yep. I'm a trial lawyer, and I'm using a lot of computers. Just any, whatever comes in the door is what you're doing, yeah. We, yes, Mary does what I do, so I probably won't have anything for you, but maybe. Maybe I can show you something. <laughs> Go ahead. Great, great. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Yes, yeah. Okay. Court of Appeals, gotcha. Great. Back in the back. An intern, and Elizabeth's another law librarian over here. Uh, probate of states, uh, wills. Great, okay. Perfect, okay. Great. Perfect. Okay. 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 Environmental again. Okay. Great. Real estate and probate. But all my environmental people in probate are on this side of the room. No. <laughs> um, okay. Great. So I think that we'll have some things built in for everyone. Um, one of the things that we have to be sort of realistic about when we talk about legal ethics and legal research is that you have a duty to present both to your client and to the court accurate information, right? This is one of our big duties. And a lot of you probably do similar things most days, right? You kind of know what you're doing. You have an area. It's your area. You've done it a million times, or if you're an intern, you've done it never, you're learning everything, so everything's unknown. But for the rest of you, there are some of these known areas. And so we can sort of talk about known versus unknown in a different way when we think about legal research and sort of tips for both. And in talking to a lot of people who are trial lawyers, I've heard that so often in Harris County, you don't really wanna go in with a stack of cases, maybe a little different for regulatory work, but that you know, it's really not the way we practice to come in with like this body of law and slap it down, that it's, it's not quite that formal, but we still need to know the law, right? And we still need to digest this information, even if that's not the end product that we're producing. Is that, is that pretty correct? I'm looking at my trial lawyers, they're nodding 
dubiously. Um, okay, so if we have a known topic, and this is sort of our area, these are my points of advice for you. The first thing I would do is take the three or four things that you use all the time, right? So the three or four cases, three or four statutes, three or four regs, and I would set an alert on those things so that any time something new came up about those topics, it will come to my email and I can tell it when to come. And I don't really have to worry that I'm missing something or that something's missing from my research and my accurate information because it's physically going to come to my email and say, there is a new Texas Supreme Court case that has negative information about this case that is the case you use 10 times out of 10 times when you bring this issue before the court. So those can be really helpful. The other thing I would say is to choose one or two important news searches that you read at least weekly. Um, I know because I was in corporate world for a long time, it's very hard to find time to keep abreast of new things when you have such a large workload in front of you and you just have so much paper to digest and phone calls to return. But you really need to set that, side, set that time aside to just make sure that you're up to date on everything that's happening. And one tip I want to give you is a service called law360.com. Now, if you have a Lexus subscription, you may have seen this before. But before Lexus bought it, it was a standalone website. It is quite expensive. However, the email alerts are free. You can sign up for an email alert. All you're going to get is the snippet, but you're going to get it right away. So then you know when it's breaking news, and you can go and search it some other way, pass it on to your lovely paralegal, who then is flagged with finding it, or find it through another news outlet that you do have access to. Um, it's a great service. There are so many different newsletters here for all of your different practice areas, and they really break things super, super quickly. So here's intellectual property. You put your email in, you sign up, and they will send you these emails. They will occasionally send you a sales pitch, but it's not so much that it's going to outweigh the quick delivery of breaking news in your field that you can get from Law 360. Okay. I can't always promise that those will be free, but it's been a while and they're still free. So we'll keep hoping that they'll keep them for free. Okay, so what about when I have an unknown topic? Something new and strange walks in the door and I have to do this. Or something that I've been doing a long time changes from the way that I've been doing it. I think it's important to, to remember how to base your legal research. Because often we're so busy, we just want to hop into that service, pop some words in and go, right? It seems easy, it seems fast, but it's not really the way to get great results with a lot of reliability. And so the thing that I most want to remind you of today, if you walk out and forget everything else, is remember secondary sources, right? Do you remember back to law school and what a secondary source is? So primary sources are anything that has the authority of law. It's your cases. It's your statutes. It's sort of your regs, right? That's all the primary stuff. The secondary sources are anything that describe those primary sources. And they're the things that can really give you an understanding of the law. So we think, you know, this is your Corbin on contracts, right? This is your Benedict on Admiralty. These are the people who are experts in the area who have taken the time to really write about these topics and give you an understanding. And they will lead you to cases. They will get you to cases, but they will help you have a broader understanding. And if it's true that in Harris County, it's not always great to go with a pile of cases to court, Great, because now you'll have an understanding of the law and you're not really spending your time hunting and pecking 10 or 12 cases, right? So let's look at how to find secondary sources. If you want to find them in print, it's pretty easy. What you do is you walk here, you go upstairs, and you walk to the nice reference desk, and all the people there who have law degrees, this is what they do. They would joy. And, you, and it's really, they really do joy in it. For you to come up and say, I've got a case, it's on this, I really need a great secondary source. They're going to really get excited about helping you find a secondary source. Uh, Marianne's smiling because she knows it's true. <laughs> so if you want to find it in print, that's the way you do it. If you want to find it online, let's look together. <clears throat> so you'll see secondary sources 
are sort of gathered together both on Westlaw and Lexis. Westlaw has a few more secondary sources than Lexis, but Lexis certainly has them. So really, whichever one you prefer, you can go there. You can either go in by topic or you can just come in to secondary sources directly. You can limit it and say that you only want to look at Texas. And Texas has some pretty good stuff. You're in a pretty good state for specialized secondary resources. But it's OK not to do that, because you can always take your cases and make them Texas specific later in your research. Getting this broad understanding, it's OK to get something that's just at a broad level. And the nice thing, too, about searching in secondary sources is you don't have to be a very good searcher. You can be sort of a general searcher and get pretty relevant results. You do that in cases, you get a lot of junk, right? But secondary sources aren't built that way, so you can be a little bit less specific. Okay, so really at this point, I could go into my box and write whatever I wanted to write. Um, contracts, and you'll see here in secondary sources, it's going to give me some ideas of what it thinks I should go to. Obviously, you're going to have a more specific problem that you're going to put in. So I'm just searching for dog bites here. It's always a good test one. And we'll start to see some, some results here. Now if I think, you know, I don't really care about law reviews, I don't really find this helpful, you can always come over to your publication type and choose which publication types you'd like to see and filter any of that stuff out. So that's really helpful. Lexis works very similarly. Here's your secondary materials tab. You go in, you choose. They have all the same bells and whistles, just in a different color scheme. Okay. In class, if you were my student, we would spend a whole class racing. I would split you up, and I would have one side of the class only search in primary sources, and one side of the class only search in secondary sources to answer legal questions that I presented to you. And what I generally find is that although both sides produce materials about as quickly, when we rate confidence and quality of materials, my left side wins every time. And the students, I don't have to pop your illusions, you already know. This pops their illusion about how great they are at searching cases when they see this is the way to call the expert, right? If we had the expert's phone number, that's what we would do. We would just call and say, oh, I got this case. I know you do this all the time. What do I do? This is your way to do it, okay? So when I said that you could take something from any jurisdiction and bring it to your jurisdiction, let's see how you do that. All right, so let's say that this Fordham Law Review is really the thing that I think is fantastic, and it's really the one I want to read. I can go in, love this topic, and maybe this is the case that I really think is a great case. Not found. You can see it's a live demo. I didn't plan it. Bear with me as I find a case. Okay. No ill will toward Fordham that I can't find a working case site in their law review. Okay, here we go. Oh, that's another journal. Okay. I'm just going to pull a case so I don't waste your time. But in theory, you could pull whatever site you wanted to pull. And then as I go through, let's say Alabama doesn't matter to me, I really want Texas. What I can do is find the point of law that I really cared about in the head notes here. And we're going to do this a couple times, so it's okay if you don't catch it the first time. You click into the head note, and you will see here all of the different cases on that head note. But also note where it says jurisdiction, change. Just going to pop in there. I'm going to say no to Alabama. What I really want is Texas. Apply. And now it's going to make me my own personal digest. So those of you who remember working with the print digest, what this is doing is digest on demand. It's just making you your own digest of just your topic and just your jurisdiction in that moment. So let's do it together again. Let's say that I like this case, Tenant Health Systems. Pull up the case, and I'm going to read through those headnotes and figure out 
which head note it is that's really on my topic. And then I'm going to pick that very last, most specific little number. Don't have to remember it. I can just click right in. And then I can change my jurisdiction. Okay? If you don't have a Westlaw subscription, guess what? Harris County does. You can go right up and sit for free at those terminals and use theirs. Okay? So you change your jurisdiction. Let's say, nope, got to take this up to the Fifth Circuit. Apply. And there we go. Okay? If you are a Lexis user, Lexis does have an equivalent of head notes. It's not quite as strong, but it's really strong. So you're still going to be okay using the same system on Lexis, and it works exactly the same way. Look through the cases, find the one you like, find the note that you like, click in, change the jurisdiction. Okay? Is that a good skill? Everybody excited? You just want to go try it right now? No. Okay. All right, so then when we have our topics, we have our things, one of the most important things you have to do ethically is make sure that your research is still valid, right? And if you don't believe me, let's go back in time and believe poor Marsha Clark as she sits um, in Judge Ito's court um, on the O.J. Simpson trial. Okay, let's watch Marsha. Allegations will change the truth. I'd like to address the legal issue on motions to reconsider counsel. Yes, and that's, I would thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> I got five tracks. No, there is no, I'm sorry. There is no, uh, there is no legal provision for a motion for reconsideration in criminal law. That is only in civil law. It is recognized in Civil Code of Procedures Section 1008. And what they require in civil law is that the party seeking re reconsideration show newly discovered facts. In this case, we have no newly discovered facts with respect to the motion for reconsideration of Laura McKinney. But don't, I, you don't the yeah, doesn't case law dealing with that particular code section include criminal cases? Shepard Act, the Supreme Court. Believe it. No, no, I, we don't have any in our motion, which leads me to believe that no, there aren't any criminal cases under that section. And, you asked me that question because you knew Ms. Lewis wrote a motion. No. <laughs> but uh, no, as far as I know, there are no criminal law cases that uh, that involve that section because it's not recognized in criminal law. So, I mean, uh, at least in theory, we didn't have to have all the argument. But so, if my paper that law clerks found some. Did they? Did they? Criminal cases? And what do they say? <laughs> Ter that's a terrible moment, right? I mean, it's like it happened you know, 20 years ago and we're all shaking for poor Marsha Clark that the Pepperdine law clerks found those, um, found those cases that she didn't find. And poor Miss Lewis, I mean, she really hung her out to dry. Um, we'll have a management lesson there when she's like, you know, Miss Lewis did this work, not me, right, right? And then in the next clip, Miss Lewis starts running. You can only imagine to like a folio where she's going through her work. So. Um, Obviously, we're, we're not all being filmed, thank goodness, um, but having updated research is very important. And the good news is you guys all have the luxury of having both a Lexus and a Westlaw terminal upstairs for free, so there is literally no excuse to not validate and make sure that your research is good to go before you go to court or you advise a client because they both have the same weight under our ethical obligation. So. Let's look at how to do it, and I want to say that I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking to you about other low-cost services that try to equivocate Keysight and Shepherds, and here's why. We all know artificial intelligence is a big thing, right? It's in the news all the time. Most of the systems that aren't Keysight and Shepherds are built on algorithms. So it's basically a computer deciding these are the things that you should look at. They're fine. If you're doing research and you're just leading yourself to other cases, they're fine. But for validating, I would really rather us as a community count on these things that are, do have fabulous algorithms, but also have hand-edited results. So there are football fields of attorneys sitting in Egan, Minnesota, hand-editing these notes. 
And that's the kind of confidence we want to have in our search results. That's what we're paying for when we pay for this. So, um, and especially since the terminals are right above us, we have no excuse but to come and use those two services. So Shepherds is actually Lexus's brand of validating service. We often call all updating shepherdizing, the same way in Mississippi we call all soda coke. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's all Shepherds, right? Shepherds is a Lexus product, and the Westlaw product is Keysight. They are very comparable. Um, law librarians actually test them against each other. Yes, we're those kind of nerds. And very rarely do we find a difference between them in results, but sometimes the Lexus content's just a little richer, right? So sort of the opposite of the head notes that we were talking about just a moment ago. All right, so let's just go in. We're not gonna restart right now. Um, and look at these, okay. So in Westlaw, if you go into any case, and you can also go into a statute, or you can go into a regulation, you're going to be able to do your Keysight or Shepherds right from that service. And they've changed it a little bit. What they've done is that the Keysight now just sits at the top in these tabs, okay? So you can see the first thing that they do is show you, in that first tab, the actual filings of this case that you're looking at. It's direct history and filings. This case doesn't have any negative treatment, but if it did, it would be in the next tab, and we'll look at one that does have negative treatment in a minute. And then you're gonna see the direct history of this case. They give you a little picture in case it's really complicated. Sometimes when it gets complicated, this picture gets a little hard to read to me, but still nice effort there. So you can see that it's been affirmed here. And then you get to the meaty stuff, the citing references. So the citing references are anything that has put in a citation to your case that you're looking at. That could be cases, that could be secondary sources, that could be any all kinds of things, right? So you can say I only want to see the cases or maybe I want to see trial court briefs or other appellate documents. I'm trying to formulate an argument. All those things are there. And finally, the good old table of authorities. So these are all the cases mentioned in your case. And if you're relying on an idea that's come through a lineage of cases, this is a great way to come in and see if where it is. You'll see it has the little flags here for you. So let's talk about those little flags. So in Lexis, they're actually different shaped symbols, and we'll look at those in a moment. So if you're colorblind, I recommend you use Lexis because it will actually have a different shape for you. The Westlaw flags are all the same shape, okay? So they do it like this. They have a green, a blue, a yellow, and a red. The blue we'll talk about in a minute, but let's talk about green, yellow, red. We really think about these like a traffic signal, right? When we see a red, we don't turn off our car, walk away, and just live on the corner, right? We stop, we wait until we know it's okay to proceed, and then we go. And that's the same thing we do when we get a red signal. It doesn't mean you abandon your case and it's bad law. Guess what has a red flag? Miranda, okay? Still good law, right? Doesn't mean we throw it out. It means we have to process what's negative about it and make sure it's still okay to use. And these services make that really, really easy to do. Okay, so since we're talking about it, Go to Miranda v. Arizona. And you'll see those same tabs starting to appear. They're going to be a lot bigger on this case. So the internet's taking just a minute to populate it. But we do indeed have negative treatment this time. 239 things, right, that are negative about Miranda v. Arizona. And just like we've seen sort of consistently, I can say, you know, I don't really want to see everything. I only want to see things with a certain head note. I only want to see things from a certain date. Or I only want to see things from a certain jurisdiction. And we can filter those down and get a smaller list because we don't have time to digest 239 cases, right? We need a smaller pool. So we can do that. And it's telling you right away. U.S. v. Dickerson is the most negative thing, so that's the thing we want to be sure that we've looked at. And they give you this handy thing in both services where they show you a little set of eyeglasses if you've already looked at this case, so you know, I've been there, I've read that. Okay.
questions so far on that, on Westlaw, key citing? No, you're ready. Somebody's going to have to come up now. Just kidding. I'm not going to make you come up. Okay, let's do the same thing in Lexis. I'm going to put our case in. And you'll see it's substantially similar, but instead of being at the top, it comes over here on the right. The other thing you can still do in Lexis is click right in to that Miranda v. Arizona case. And then it will give you all of this information on the side. So when we talked earlier about alerts, this is what I mean. If you're doing this work and you have a brief or a case that's coming up in four days, in 24 days, and you're doing this work now, this is especially for my paralegals and my interns, set that alert. Because then, if your work needs to be updated, you get an immediate notification that something has popped up since you did the work. And you won't have to stop the day before the trial and do all the work over again. You'll be updated that it needs new work. For those of you that have some seminal cases that you keep in your pocket for all times, this is where you set that alert. I will say, unfortunately, the free terminals upstairs will not let you set alerts, so you do have to have a subscription or perhaps a friend with a subscription to set these alerts for you. Okay? All right, let's go back into Shepherds and just look through. So just like we had the direct history, they're calling it appellate history, but they're, they're showing you the same things. These are the actual times that this case has, has gone through direct history. And then we have our citing decisions. So Lexis breaks it up between decisions and other resources. Westlaw had it all together. So this is just showing you all of the cases that have cited back to your case. And then they have a different place to show you all the secondary sources and newsletters and all those things that also cite to your case. And then finally, there's your table of authority. And again, when we're in these, um, in these things, we can narrow by different topics. You'll see here, you can pull, I only want to see the warnings, I only want to see the cautions, I only want to see the Fifth Circuit. You can pick multiple things, and just like we created a custom digest, you can create that custom Shepherds. And I'm not sure if any of you actually did Shepherds in print and are willing to remember those days of all the different colored little booklets, but what you're doing instead is creating your own custom Shepherds by doing this. If you feel confident that you could do this, that you could go and run one of these reports, they make it pretty simple for you. Okay. Let's move forward. All right. I did that. So I'm going to show you, um, just, I just want to show you a snippet of pricing because I don't like to talk about these things without being realistic about pricing. Obviously, you have the free terminals upstairs. Um, this is for Westlaw, small and solo. You can get a subscription that has Keysight included for about $85 a month. Um, that's the lowest sort of price. That is a Texas and federal sort of subscription. And likewise on Lexus for about $109 a month, you can get that subscription. The unfortunate news is that none of these companies allow you anymore to just use a credit card and do a one-off. They've gotten rid of that. They really want you to have a subscription. They've gotten the subscription prices down very low, but I definitely remember a time when you could shepherdize with a credit card. You could go to shepherdize and just do the two or three cases you needed, pass those costs right onto the client, and have a clean finish. But they've really moved to a subscription model and tried to make those subscriptions at a very low price. And Lexus especially will push you to sort of a multi-year deal. So this is when all of the government employees should take a deep sigh that you never have to worry about your contract, that other people are negotiating that for you, and all of these solo practitioners will kick you a little in the shin as you walk out because they know the reality of trying to deal with these companies. Okay, great service, but a little tricky. All right, so the other thing I want to make sure that we all remember how to do it is to notice the version of statute that you're using and make sure that you're using the right statute for your time, right? Law students always think this is a big, mysterious process, but it's actually a very simple process, right? At the bottom of every statute, there's a note, and it will tell you every time that law has changed, and it will give you the, the citation, and it will give you the year. 
From about the middle of the 80s forward, it will actually be a clickable link on these services. So you can just click into it and you can go and look at the old version. Past the 80s, you'll have to use another service or you'll have to walk yourself over to the law library and ask for help and they will help you get on those. If you have access to Hine Online, which I know you do here in the building, they actually have every state, all of the old session laws, so you can look at them that way. Okay? So just remember, you go to the bottom of the statute and there will be the note that will have all of the versions for you. All right. We talked about alerts um, and going into Lexis and Westlaw and creating alerts. But one thing I like to remind people is that in this sort of 24-hour news cycle that we're in, I caution you against signing up for too many services or perhaps open a separate free email box that's only for all those junky services because you can get a little bit too much and then you stop reading anything, right? So there are news aggregators, there are free ones. Google News is a good one where you can go in and put all your places into one place and you can tell it, I only want to see this weekly. You can tell it, I want to see it Tuesday at 530. And it will gather them for you and it will put it out. Okay, so I encourage you, just don't get, don't sign up for everything. Or if you do, don't put it to your main email box or you'll regret it. All right. So you can set law alerts for all of these services for validating. You can put things um, on your searches to update you if there are new search um, items that show up for you. You can also do regulations for those of you who said you did reg work. Um, you know, the Federal Register will actually send you a daily digest on a topic if you want to stay on the topic. I used to get the Federal Register for certain things on my desk every day. Um, I'm, I sort of love the Federal Register, but you can get those to come straight to your email box now. Or if you're just, you just care about the CFR and you don't want to know every little alert, you can get just sections affected can come to your email box too. And the way you do that is to go straight to fr.gov or cfr.gov and they have that as a free service. You do have to create an account, but luckily the government will never try to sell you anything Although, who knows if they sell your information. Okay. And lastly, you can set alerts for dockets. You can do those on Westlaw and Lexis, but there's also some other great services. If you really need to have docket alerting, my favorite is Courthouse News. Have any of you ever used Courthouse News? It is a pay service. You do have to pay. But they will go even to a civil docket in a tiny place. So if you have like a three or four county or parish practice and you really wish you were getting the civil or criminal docket, for those counties, they will send it to you. It's just the docket, but you can call and say, hey, I see you're getting sued before the person has even been served. And that can really help you build a business or just stay up to date on a business. Okay. <clears throat> so I talk just, just for a second about citations. Um, again, if you were my poor students, I would make you do a lot of blue booking. But what I'll say for your citations is just make sure that someone can follow them, that someone can find the thing that you're talking about, include your date and make it something that the person who has to come behind you and figure out what you're talking about can find it. And all my paralegals are saying, yes, they're nodding their heads up and down. Because as you write a brief, there's nothing worse than the person trying to answer it, being able to say, this is wrong and nobody knows what we're talking about. And you've done good research and you've done good work, but you haven't produced a readable citation. Right? So just take that moment to make sure that your citation is usable. Okay, before we go to questions, I want to show you one other cool thing because I showed it to a group of lawyers recently and they got really excited about it. Um, do you guys know about this that exists, the Wayback Machine? Have you seen this before? So this is a brick and mortar library, a charitable library in California that basically runs an internet archive. So you can choose a date and time and go back and look at a website as it used to be, right? And we know this is super important. When I was working for Phelps in private practice, we were involved um, in a dispute with a place that had a website that had a lot of great information on it. We go into this deposition and we start producing these printouts of the website and they were like, where did you get this? We took all this down. And we're like, it was on the Internet Archive. We went 
and got it there. Um, I had someone ask me, how do you make sure that that's authenticated in court? And I'll tell you, I'm not the evidence professor, so, but, I'm, but it is a real place. It's not just like an internet address. Um, they're a real 501c3, so I'm sure that they have ways to validate that information. It's not comprehensive because it's only as good as can be searched. So there are some things that are too deep like what we call the dark internet, if you remember hearing that on the news, or the dim internet where sites aren't very well connected. You can't really get to those things, but you can get to anything that was on the surface layer unless the lawyers called and had it removed. So for instance, if you go and try to find anything negative about Scientology on the Wayback Machine, you will see it's not there because they have very aggressive lawyers who are making sure that it's not preserved when they get something taken down off of the web, right? So very cool, and it's just, just archive.org forward slash web, or you can Google Wayback Machine, and you'll get it here. Um, and we can, we can go look at something. Do we want to look at the Harris County Law Library's web page? Does it get fun depending on how far back you go? The sad thing is the UH Law Library web page doesn't look a lot different than it did like in 1980. Um, so here we go. It's saying that we have 38 different, 193 different captures. Luckily for you guys, they're mostly pretty current, but we can go back to 2005 and we can look at how it was on March 21st in 2005. Do you remember it, Marianne, or you, you don't? This is going to be a surprise for everybody. Um, and you'll see it's a pretty complete service. Sometimes if you click into a link, the link won't actually go anywhere, but mostly it's a pretty good service. It looks substantially the same. Pretty close. So you can go in and see how things used to be. Okay. Questions. What do you guys have? Anything? Someone earlier today said, lawyers just love to listen to themselves talk. And I said, you know how I know you're wrong, because when I ask groups of lawyers if they have questions, they all just look at me like, no, we don't want to say anything. No? Okay, so do you feel confident that you could go and set an alert service? Is anybody excited about Law 360? Is anybody going to go check that out? Yes. Alerts. Good things, right? You all feel confident you could go and either key site or shepherdize a case and you get why it's a little more important to do that. We're not going to do that on like a secondary service or trust Google Advance, right? We're going to, we're really going to go there. Yes? Yeah? Okay, well that's the content that I have for you today. I thank you so much for your time and attention. I will stay up here in case there's a question that you had that you just didn't want to ask in front of a colleague for a competitive edge. Um, but thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much to Harris County for having me as a guest. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. The Harris County Law Library would like to thank Professor Amanda Watson for sharing her expertise on fulfilling ethical obligations with legal research. During her program, Professor Watson mentioned several useful resources including Westlaw, Lexis Advance, and Hein Online that legal professionals can use to ensure their research is accurate and up to date. The Harris County Law Library makes these databases available to all, free of charge, on 25 public access computers at our downtown Houston location. You can also find regularly scheduled training opportunities to help you learn to use these resources, as well as helpful law librarians who can provide guidance on navigating these complex resources Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. With free access to professional databases within steps of the courthouse, and free training opportunities, the Harris County Law Library has the tools you need to perform accurate, ethical, legal research. Let's take a closer look. At the Harris County Law Library, you have access to professional legal research databases just like practitioners do. Our most robust subscription is through Thomson Reuters Westlaw, which also happens to be the legal database that many of the local courts and administrative agencies use. Through this database, you can find access to things like cases, statutes, and regulations. But you can also find access to some of the leading secondary sources that Professor Watson discussed during her portion of the program. Secondary sources are important because they provide context and analysis from leading experts in a topic, a practice area, or jurisdiction. 
Uh, they're also some of the most expensive resources out there, so it's important to have access to those when you need it. Secondary sources will point you in the direction of leading case law in an area, as well as statutes and regulations that address a specific topic. Let's take a look at the secondary sources that are available on Westlaw at the Harris County Law Library. As you can see at the top here, we have access to some of the leading secondary sources available, including ALRs, legal encyclopedias, and other texts and treatises. Further down, you'll notice we have access to secondary sources from all 50 states, including Texas, of course, which is important to local researchers. Continuing down, we have access to treatises and secondary sources by topic, uh, which is very important if you want to narrow down the hundreds of thousands of documents you can find on this database to a specific practice area. Let's take a look at those Texas resources that are available since that's the jurisdiction most of our local practitioners use. One thing to note is as you drill down into different uh, organizational levels within the database, at the top here, this menu will change as the browsing menu changes, which means as you type in your search, you will only be searching the portion of the database in which you've drilled down into. In Texas secondary sources, that's going to include treatises like McDonald and Carlson, Texas Jurisprudence, Texas Practice Series and Guides, and local journals and law reviews. Form books and practice guides are also a very important component of this database. All of these resources are as up-to-date as are available to anyone because Westlaw updates them very quickly, which means the information that you'll find here is as accurate as the experts in the area have made available. The Harris County Law Library's subscription to Westlaw also includes the editorial enhancements Professor Watson mentioned, which help you practice ethically with regard to your legal research. So for example, here we have the landmark case, Brown versus Board of Education, and you can see it has a yellow flag indicator, which means that there's been some negative treatment in the years after 1954 when the Supreme Court issued its opinion. You can immediately go to negative treatment here under the negative treatment tab, and you can see 31 documents are listed there. Westlaw will list the most negative cases at the top, and then as you scroll down, you'll also see the cases that have discussed your case in the subsequent history. Next to each one of those cases, if those cases have subsequent history, there will be a key site flag indicator for how those cases have been treated as well, which allows you to quickly move through to see whether or not your case is still good law. In addition to negative history, you can see all history. Of course, with landmark cases, you're going to have a substantial number of documents following the issuance of the opinion by the Supreme Court. Case of Brown versus Board of Education, you have over 24,000 documents citing to this case. When you hover over the tab, you can see the different types of documents that cite to your case, which include other cases secondary sources, trial court documents, just a number of, of different things. So depending on the type of research you're doing, you might be interested in, in different types of documents. Of course, if you go to those secondary sources again, you're going to find context and analysis that lead you to other similar cases or perhaps ones that are more specific to the topic you're researching. Additionally, you have table of authorities as a tab. When you click on that, you're going to find citations to the cases that are relied upon by your case. So these are cases and other documents that are cited in the opinion, Brown versus Board of Education. As you can see, the flag indicators are here as well, which help you quickly move through and determine whether or not your case depends on another case or statute or another document that is now bad law. And that's an important component of updating your research, finding good law. One last editorial enhancement that we should mention are headnotes. Wes puts a lot of effort into their headnotes. Because of that, 
you have the option of finding similar cases based on the topic that you're researching with the headnotes quickly and easily, which allows you to make sure that you're using the leading cases for that specific subject. As we change the view here, you can see that it is arranged in the classic key number fashion, and so that allows you to quickly move through similar case law to update your research and also to expand your research if you find a case that's close but not exactly on point. You can also access the leading database Lexis Advance for your legal research at the Harris County Law Library for free. And that's important because different materials appear on different databases. Now the cases, statutes, and regulations should appear the same because those are issued by government agencies. But where this really plays out is in the secondary materials. So for example, if we click on the secondary materials that are available on Lexis Advance at the Harris County Law Library, we'll find different listings from the ones that you saw for Westlaw. And if we continue to scroll down, we can find the Texas-specific secondary materials, which are going to include titles such as Dorsanios, the Transactions Guide, that many local practitioners rely on. So for example, Dorsanios is only available from Matthew Bender, which is a publisher acquired by Lexis Advance, and you won't find that on Westlaw. In some cases, that means practicing ethically will mean doing research on multiple databases to ensure a comprehensive view of a specific practice area. If we click on Dorsanios, we can see chapters are laid out just as they are in the print resource, and everything is available for print or download at the Harris County Law Library. If we go back to the home page for Lexis Advance, we'll also see that news and legal news are options on the home menu. This is important because, as Professor Watson mentioned, staying on top of developments in your area of practice is necessary from an ethical point of view. If we scroll down, we can find Texas-specific resources, and you'll see that there are a number of reporters and updates that are important, including family law, oil and gas, and torts. As you continue to click, you'll find more specificity in your search menu here which makes it easy to zero in on the content you're looking for with your search terms. Thank you for watching Fulfilling Ethical Obligations with Legal Research, a CLE from the Legal Tech Institute at the Harris County Law Library. And we'd like to thank Professor Watson from University of Houston Law Center, O'Quinn Law Library, for being our guest speaker for this program. Please be sure to report your CLE credit via texasbar.com using the course number on your screen. There is to it. For more learning opportunities like this, including online tutorials and in-person training sessions, visit the Harris County Law Library's Legal Tech Institute website at www.harriscountylawlibrary.org tech.